Thank you, Senator Pocock. The time has expired. Senator Macdonald will move to question time. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Does Australia need to increase gas production to meet export and domestic demand while lowering gas prices? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank, um, thank the Senator for her question and her interest uh, in this uh, topic, of course. <clears throat> um, the important thing, I think, about um, particularly the, the safeguards bill, but the issue of ongoing uh, supply, of, uh, uh, supply of gas is that <clears throat> we are moving to transition out of uh, fossil fuels and into um, uh, renewable uh, fuels. In fact, uh, you'll have heard the Prime Minister say this week that he wants Australia to be a uh, renewable superpower, a renewable energy superpower. Um, Minister the Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. On relevance, I had specifically asked about whether or not Australia needs to increase its gas production. Uh, yes, thank you. I will um, direct the minister to your question. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, <coughs> pre uh, President. Um, um, so the, the, the really difficult thing here, um, Senator, uh, is that <coughs> you've got to ensure there's ongoing investment uh, in gas production, particularly in this, uh, in this country. Uh, while, while, while you do that transition uh, to renewables. Now, what, what might that transition look like? Well, it might be hydrogen. As you know, the South Australian government is, um, the South Australian government is uh, uh, leading Minister the way. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. President, I don't have much time. Specifically on relevance, does Australia need to increase its gas production? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. The minister is being relevant to your question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, President. And if you could just let me um, finish what I'm uh, talking. Well, it's an, uh, you might call it uh, waffle, but it's an important, it's an important, it's an important issue because to <coughs> to get that transition. Uh, from uh, fossil fuel to uh, renewable fuel, we have to ensure that there's continued investment in coal and gas. And it's the it's the it's the objective it's the objective of this government to ensure that we. Um Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Macdonald, first supplementary. I'm going to have another go. By how much does Australia need to increase gas production to meet export and domestic demand while lowering gas prices? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, <coughs> thank you President, and uh, thank, uh, uh, thank the Senator for her uh, first uh, supplementary uh, question. Um, of course, between um, 2014 and 2021, uh, East Coast uh, gas production increased by 300 uh, per cent. Um, and that's, of course, um, despite problems like uh, access to the uh, Narrabri uh, gas, uh, gas supplies. Despite um, supply going up significantly, the prices paid by Australian households and Australian industry also went up by 420 per cent in real terms. <coughs> yeah, 420 per cent, uh, Senator Pratt. <coughs> Over that uh, same period of time, the former the former government—that's <coughs> the government that you were. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. President, on relevance, what is the uh, increase that is required? Um, the minister is addressing your question. Uh, I'll refer him to the latter part of your question, which was about prices. Minister Farrell. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, President. Um, now the former government was warned on at least a dozen. Well, you can't, you can't, you can't understand. Thank you, Minister. The, the time for answering has expired. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Given the ACCC and the Australian energy market operator have identified a need to increase gas production, what government policies, inclusive of the proposed safeguard mechanism, will deliver the required increase in gas production? 
Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Farrell. Well, I, in my first answer, uh, Senator, yes. thank you, uh, President, for <coughs> um, that, and uh, thank uh, the Senator for her, um, her second supplementary qu question. Um, <coughs> I've explained to you in my first answer, uh, Senator, that the, the trick here, the trick here, is to ensure that there's sufficient investment uh, in gas and coal to allow for, uh, so, main, uh, for uh, well, well, the whole, the whole of government, the whole of uh, government, Minister, the whole of government. I thought I have a Senator, Minister Farrell, Minister Farrell, resume your seat. Resume your seat. I have a, min a senator on her feet, Senator Macdonald. President, no tricks. What is the government's uh, policies to provide for increased gas production? Uh, thank you, Senator Macdonald. And I'll again draw the minister to your question, Minister Farrell. So, thank you, President. Um, unlike, unlike the former government, we have got we've got a rounded policy to ensure, firstly, uh, that we secure our uh, electricity supplies in this country, including putting down, as I've spoken many times, including putting downward pressure on uh, electricity prices, but ensuring that all of our investment policies um, are directed to making that transition that even Thank your you, government— Thank you, Minister. Even the time your... for answering has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister update the Senate on the progress that the Albanese government has made in taking the country forward on climate action? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President, and I thank Senator Grogan uh, for the question and also for her strong advocacy in the area of uh, climate policy over many years. At the last election, the Australian people voted undeniably for action on climate change. The Albanese government has a mandate to deliver this climate action, and I welcome the fact that we have been able to secure additional parliamentary support for the safeguard mechanism reforms. After a decade of inaction from those opposite, that's right, they created the problem, hid the problem, and then opposed to any solutions. After a decade of inaction, we can finally put Australia on a credible path to achieve net zero by 2050. Yeah. Just remember that those opposite agree with net zero by 2050. They just can't agree with any credible path to get there. The safeguard mechanism, as agreed by a majority of this chamber later this week, um, and we are deeply appreciative of the work that has gone in from crossbench members in working with us, including the Greens party, and Senator Pocock, Senators Lambie, Tyrrell and Senator Thorpe, who have worked uh, collegiately, as is required by this chamber, to land in a sensible outcome. And it really is for those opposite to explain why they dealt themselves out at the earliest opportunity without even having a discussion. This uh, passage of the Safeguards Mechanism Bill will allow policy certainty for the first time after 22 failed energy policies, announced 22, couldn't deliver one of them. Business and investors uh, have been after this policy certainty for some time. The jobs, the new industries and the opportunities that will come from having a credible path to net zero should not be underestimated by this chamber. And I thank those who have engaged willingly with the government on these negotiations. Thank you, Minister. Senator Grogan, first supplementary. That's great news, Minister. Great news. Um, it's, uh, can the Minister now update the Senate on the importance of the reforms to the safeguard mechanism to new facilities? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Gallagher. And I thank Senator Grogan for the question. The safeguard mechanism reforms are about strengthening the economy and ensuring industry can compete in a decarbonising world. These are landmark reforms that will reduce 205 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions to 2030. Those emissions reduction will be delivered even with new facilities. Under the reform safeguard mechanisms, new facilities will need to meet international best practice. They will need to ensure emissions decline over time. New gas fields supplying existing liquefied natural gas facilities will be treated as new facilities. And with respect to the Beetaloo Basin, our, the Albanese government is committed to working with the Northern Territory government to implement recommendation 9.8 of the Pepper Inquiry. 
The safeguard framework will help deliver the commitment to scope one emissions, and given the cross-jurisdictional nature of scope two and three emissions, the government will refer scope two and three emissions to the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council. Thank you, Minister. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, can the minister tell us what the reaction has been from business, climate and industry groups to the confirmation of parliamentary support for the safeguard reform mechanism? Thank you, Sen Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I thank Senator Grogan for the supplementary. And yes, I can. Support from senators to help uh, that pass the safeguard mechanism reforms has been widely welcomed, from the Australian Conservation Foundation to the Australian Industry Group and the Climate Council and the Business Council. The Business Council said these reforms were tough but achievable, and we think that's right. We have a policy which is ambitious but achievable, and uh, the work that has gone into getting that balance right and seeking support from this chamber has been uh, considerable. Mr Innes Wilcox of the Australian Industry Group said that industry will view the announced deal with some relief that pragmatism and reasonable compromise have prevailed. Now business and government have to get on with the large task of implementing this reform and supporting transformative investments in industry. Sensible response to good, sensible policy reform that those opposite have rejected and disengaged from for over a decade now. Thank you, Minister. Senator Dunningham. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. He does. The Greens yesterday stated that their deal on the safeguard mechanism has, quote, secured a pollution trigger for the first time in history on climate pollution. Can the Minister confirm that the government has agreed to adopt this climate trigger? Oh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Dunningham for his uh, his question. And uh, of course, I can let the Greens uh, speak for themselves on uh, their uh, their side of the uh, their side of the uh, agreement. What 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 I want what I want to do what I want to do is recognise the support that this agreement has got, uh, both from conservation groups. All the way, all the way to uh, to uh, business uh, groups. Just uh, <coughs> to give one example, uh, Jennifer Westacott uh, from the Business Council. Business welcomes progress towards uh, ending Minister the Farrell. impasse. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Dunningham. President, it wouldn't surprise you to know I'm about to take a point of order on mm -hmm. direct relevance. And while I'm appreciative of all the glowing endorsements he seems to have manufactured, I asked a specific question. Can I have an answer, please? Uh, thank you. You asked particularly about um, the Greens' position on a number of matters, and the minister has been relevant to that. Minister, uh, Senator Birmingham. On the, on the point of order in your ruling, President, uh, uh, Senator Dunningham did not ask about the Greens' position. The question he asked was, can the minister confirm that the government has agreed to adopt this climate trigger? Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Birmingham, he, the question started with uh, the Greens. It went to safeguard mechanisms. It went to climate pollution and a climate trigger. And then uh, it asked the government's position. I believe the minister is being relevant. I will continue to listen carefully, and if not, I will draw him to the question. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Uh, and uh, um, what I what I can say is that uh, we're not uh, amending the EPBC Act. Uh, what we're doing is saying that uh, when a, a project is approved under the EP EPBC Act, their emissions will be assessed against the safeguard mechanism targets. The two processes remain completely separate. It's about sensibly sharing relevant information to the safeguards uh, mechanism scheme. The scheme uh, does not give scope to the minister to reverse environmental approvals, and while the government already has accountability through the annual climate uh, change uh, statement. We are happy to add additional transparency and accountability um, to make sure the intention of the reforms are met. And I might add, <coughs> I mentioned uh, uh, Jennifer Westacott, um, the AI group um, made a comment about this, uh, <coughs> this uh, deal that uh, you don't like, uh, Senator Dunningham. He says, he he says it's a good deal. Innes Wilcox says it's a good deal. Uh, the, the treatment—no, no, no, 
Um, uh, thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Dunningham, first supplementary. Thanks, President. On the 3rd of August last year, uh, the Prime Minister and the Minister, uh, Minister Bowen were asked at a press conference if they would agree to the Greens' demands to use the safeguard mechanism to stop certain coal and gas projects. The Prime Minister's response was, quote, no in a word. Minister, why did the Prime Minister say one thing about this issue and then do completely the opposite? Uh, thank you, Senator Dunningham. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Dunningham for his, uh, his first, uh, first question. Uh, se sorry, first uh, supplementary question. Um, <clears throat> the opposition have only got themselves to blame for the position that they now find themselves in. They, they, purport to be, they purport to be a party of government. They went to the last election with a policy of uh, net zero by 2050. Um, we're, progressing. we're progressing that because we also took that policy uh, to, to the people. We're progressing that, and at every point in the, in the process, the opposition is opposed to trying to deal with this issue of decarbonising decarbonizing our economy. Um, we haven't heard a single word from the opposition about how they intend to decarbonise uh, the economy. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Dunham, second supplementary. Indeed. Thank you, President. On 6 September 2021, Mr Albanese said that if the Labor Party won office at the next federal election, quote, we will be supporting our own policies going forward at the election. We won't be in a circumstance whereby any minor party tells us what to do. In signing up to a dirty deal with the Greens on the safeguard mechanism, why has the Albanese government once again broken a promise that Mr Albanese made directly to the Australian people? Why? Order. 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 Minister. Minister Gallagher. Order. Minister Farrell. Full of questions now. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Dunningham for his uh, second uh, supplementary question. Now, look, last week we had the opportunity to deal with the referendum machinery bill, and to the credit of Senator Hume, uh, the leader, um, <coughs> uh, Mr Dutton, uh, you engaged in that process. You engaged in that process. You engaged in that process, and. As, as, a result, as a result, you were participants in that process. Now, what you haven't done— uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Dunningham. Uh, President, direct relevance. I asked him why they broke a promise. Could he uh, tell us uh, why? Thank you, Senator Dunningham. I will direct uh, the minister to your whole question, Minister. Thank you, President. Thank you, President. Now, you, you had an opportunity. You had an opportunity this week. You had Order. an opportunity this week to engage in the process. You took the decision. You took the decision to deal yourself out of that process. And, and if you continue to do that, you, if you continue to do that for the rest of the term, you will be even more irrelevant uh, than you, you are Minister right Farrell. now. Minister Farrell, the time has expired. Order on both sides of the chamber. Order. Senator Rice. Thank you, President. My question is to Senator Watt, the Minister for Agriculture and Forestry. Firstly, I seek leave to table a photo of a Tasmanian devil that was burnt to death in a post-logging fire. That is a deliberate fire that burns what is remains um, of native thank forest you, after Senator logging. Rice. I'll see if leave is granted. Uh, generally, and this was explained to the chamber last week. Generally, material is circulated. If you want to circulate it, I'm assuming. The minister will make a decision later. Yep. Uh, thank you. Please ask your question. Um, minister, Tasmanian devils are endangered, and yet logging operations signed off by your government are killing Tasmanian devils and destroying devil habitat. Minister, is this good enough? That this destruction of these, these endangered species are happening under your watch? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Rice. Well, of course, I can't comment on that particular uh, issue, having not been given the courtesy of being provided with those documents before the question was asked. Uh, but what I can say is that the Albanese government supports a sustainable forestry industry, as I have said on a number of occasions. Uh, you well know, Senator Rice, that 
the forests in Tasmania are managed under joint state and federal regional forestry agreements, uh, and, uh, and that is the system that has, has been in place for a very long time. It is underpinned by strong environmental standards, and when those standards are not met, then appropriate action is taken uh, uh, to in, for environmental protection reasons. Um, now, as I say, uh, I can't comment on the particular issues that you've raised because you haven't raised them with me before. Um, but we do recognise that it is important that we have a forestry industry in Australia that is environmentally sustainable. It's one of the reasons why our government went to the election making a significant commitment to expand the forest plantation estate. Uh, in fact, as you may be aware, Senator Rice, already about 80 per 87 per cent of the logs harvested in Australia are from plantation estates rather than that, with the remainder being from native forests. Um, and we do think that it's important to have strong environmental standards that sit beneath those regional forestry agreements, uh, and, and that, is, that is a position that we will continue to take. You would have seen uh, that in response to the Samuels review, Minister Plibersek uh, made, made the point uh, that the new national environmental standards will apply to RFAs. Uh, that position was not just accepted but, but welcomed. Uh, by the forestry industry associations, in addition to environmental organisations, and I think that that shows that the Albanese government gets a, that gets the balance right between ensuring that we can meet our timber needs while also protecting Thank the environment. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Minister, your so-called sustainable forestry is clearly unsustainable. It's abundantly clear that in Tasmania, in Victoria, in New South Wales, in WA, that logging our native forests is hurtling our threatened wildlife towards extinction, cremating Tasmanian devils in post-logging burns, destroying habitat of swift parrots, leadbeater's possums, greater gliders. Minister, why won't you end the regional forest agreements that allow this destructive logging? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. And thank you, Senator Rice, for sharing your opinions uh, with us. Uh, but as I say, Labor will always support a sustainable forestry industry. We do want sustainable forestry jobs. We need, uh, as a society, we do continue to rely on timber-based products. Uh, the jobs that the forestry industry creates, particularly in regional Australia, including in Tasmania, are important to regional economies. Uh, but forests are also valuable for their carbon storage, their native habitats, uh, and we understand that we do need strong environmental protections that sit beneath our forestry industry. As I said, uh, only in last December, Minister Plibersek announced our government's plan to reform Australia's environmental laws because those laws are broken. Uh, the, the, Graham Samuel found as much in his review that was commissioned by the former government. Uh, those laws don't protect our environment and they're frustrating for business to negotiate. Uh, and that's why uh, new environmental standards will apply to RFAs as they will to many other uh, aspects Senator of business. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, Minister. Minister, does your so-called sustainable forestry include allowing endangered species to be killed? If not, and given you won't end native forest logging, what are you going to do to ensure that Tasmanian devils and other precious wildlife are protected and not being killed in logging operations? Uh, thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Watt. Thanks, President. Thanks, Senator Rice. Well, as we have come to understand from the Greens, uh, they always insist on action to occur yesterday without thinking about the consequences. Uh, the Greens have no plan uh, for. We haven't heard Senator Rice or anyone from the Greens tell us where we would obtain timber products that we would need if we were to abolish native forestry immediately in the way that she calls for. We haven't had any word from the Greens about where the jobs would come from to replace the jobs abolished, but that's okay because the Greens never have to think about these things. They're not a party of government. They can go out there and make outlandish claims uh, that, that do not. Um, that, that do not. Order. Well, there's a couple of parties who are definitely not part of the government over there, and we hope to keep it that way for a very long time. The, uh, but the Greens don't have to think about these issues. What Labor is trying to do as a party of government is get the balance right between uh, ensuring we have the timber that we need, ensuring that regional communities are supported by jobs, while also having strong environmental protections in place. Thank you, Minister. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. 
Uh, yesterday, the minister outlined how the former government's tricky approach to budgeting has put several government programs and services at risk after July 1. Can the minister update the Senate on how the former coalition government's budget would have impacted the national institutions here in the capital, which house and protect our national stories and culture? Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh uh, for her question and again for her support for important uh, national cultural institutions Order here in the Territory. The chamber. Uh, that, as, as um, Senator Walsh said, uh, house and protect our national stories and culture. Labor's budget in October last year was the first step in cleaning up the budget mess that had been left behind what by the mess? former government. A mess left by a tricky former government that deceptively trapped the budget with $4.1 billion worth of fiscal traps and funding cliffs for essential programs and zombie measures. Since then, we have only uncovered more evidence of these traps, these funding cliffs, for programs that Australians rely on and treasure. We have also uncovered chronic underinvestment in the key cultural institutions that Australians treasure and are actually crumbling around us, literally crumbling. And those opposite did nothing. Those collecting institutions are there to make sure that the most precious items of the Australian story are kept safe are kept publicly available and are kept safe forever. But the previous government did not intend to keep these precious items safe or intact forever. The previous government only intended to care for them until June the 30th this year. What did they then do after that, I wonder? Just let the gallery sink into the lake? Let the tarp on the roof of the gallery just stay there, forever flapping in the breeze in, on the library, I should say? Additional funding runs out for the Maritime Museum on the 30th of June, for the Portrait Gallery on the 30th of June, for the National Museum on the 30th of June, for the Bundanoon Trust on the 30th of June, for the National Film and Sound Archive on the 30th of June, for the National Gallery on the 30th of June, Order. for the National Library on the 30th of June, and for Old Parliament House on the 30th of June. And then we have other programs, which I no doubt will come to in my next answer to one of Senator Walsh's uh, thank excellent you, Minister. questions. Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Order uh, on my left. Senator Walsh. Thank you. Thank you, President. Uh, and I was very pleased to visit the National Library with uh, Senator White, who took a group of us there last Monday. It is truly amazing. Minister, how would the former government's tricky approach to budgeting have put Australia's online treasure trove at risk? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. I thank Senator Walsh for advocacy for Trove, and it is a program that I have received significant representations on since taking on the role of uh, the Finance Minister. Trove is one of the Australian government's most visited online services, with more than 50,000 visits a day, and yet again, like the list that I went through before, was chronically starved of funds by the coalition. Australians from every state and territory use Trove to research and find their family history, and it's a tool that helps Australians to get to know themselves better. But not only Senator does Trove Brown. attract more than 50,000 visits a day, it's got over 1,500 dis digitised newspaper titles and 900 partner institutions. But under the coalition's proposal, their arrangements, it would run out of funding on 30 June this year, leaving thousands of Australians unable to research family history, undertake that important work, a job. But this is what we are uncovering line by line as we work Thank you, through Minister. the, the government's, former government's expired. budget. Order across the chamber. Senator McAllister. Um, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Minister, as more Australians operate their daily lives online, the role of the e-safety commissioner is becoming even more crucial. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the former government's approach to this government agency would have left Australians more at risk online, and how the Albanese Labor government will take a different approach? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Uh, minister. Well, again, I, thank you, thank you, Senator Walsh, and I understand why those opposite don't like this because we're calling them out for the way that they put their budget uh, minister together. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Order, order. Minister, please continue. Thank you. We're calling them out for the way that they put their budget together, which was these terminating measures, fund things for a year, 
don't fund things properly, Order. have a fiscal cliff and leave it for someone else to worry about, just like in energy policy and all those other areas. Actually kick the can down the road and actually w let somebody else deal with it. Well, we start, I'll take the interjection from Senator Birmingham. We started cleaning up the mess in October. $4.1 billion. We started Order. cleaning up the mess Minister and we'll Gallagher. continue it in this budget. We're all seat. dealing Minister Gallagher, Minister Farrell. Point of order, uh, President. Uh, I can't even hear the uh, minister's uh, answer, and I'd like uh, I'd uh, I'd like the opportunity to hear her uh, very fine answers to these uh, issues. Thank you, Minister Farrell. I ask the minister to resume her seat because there is too much disorder in the chamber, particularly the front bench on the left side, but not only there. I would ask senators, all senators to listen respectfully and silently. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Thank you. And on, the, on the important e-safety, Commissioner, their base funding of $10.3 million has never been increased since it was established in 2015, and it's facing a fiscal cliff of $23.3 million from the 30th of June this year. This is how they budgeted. They were budget vandals Thank and we're cleaning Minister, up the Thank you, Minister. time has expired. Senator David Pocock, first question. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister. In recent years, we've seen scandals across the public service, robo-debt, mismanagement of procurement and home affairs, continual blowouts in defence projects and the recent questionable contracts in Service Australia and the NDIA. Now there is a change in government. Is this government, uh, and please for the answer, this government, not the last government, satisfied that the ANAO has an, has an adequate budget to ensure Commonwealth departments operating legally and ethically. Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Pocock, for his uh, interest uh, in uh, this issue. And he has uh, <coughs> he has uh, gone through in uh, some significant detail all of the scandals that. Um, that uh, the um, uh, the um, Order. all of the scandals that uh, beset the uh, the previous uh, government, um, the of course the the budget for the ANOA, um, of course would ANAO um, is um, is going to be the subject uh, of um, uh, of budget uh, discussions and of course. Um, You'll know in a very short uh, period of time uh, what the uh, budget position will be for all of these um, all of these organisations. But can I say I've had some dealings with the uh, with the organisation, uh, and of course um, we saw through the uh, sports rorts uh, organisation the good work the good work that they did um, since coming to office. Um, I've had responsibility, uh, Senator uh, Pocock, for. Um, um, the, uh, the PEM system, and the PEM system was supposed to uh, uh, computerise the way in which, um, for instance, our um, travel allowance payments were made. We discovered, we discovered very quickly on coming to office. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Pocock. Sorry, point of order, uh, President. Uh, relevance. Um, my question was about the ANAO, not the PEMS system. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Pocock, the minister has referred to the ANAO, but I'll remind him of your question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Um, the, the point of reference, um, <coughs> referencing the, uh, if you'd let me finish the, my uh, question, Senator uh, Pocock, the point of reference of uh, the PEM system is that I have asked the organisation to investigate why it is that a uh, uh, a project uh, that was meant to um, simplify and speed up the way in which uh, these payments were made uh, has not done that. Has not done that, and continues and continues to cost Thank the, you, Minister. Uh, Australian the time public for answering has millions expired. and millions. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and, and thank you, Minister. Has the government been approached by the Auditor General or any ANAO executive to request additional funding? Thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Minister Farrell. Um, 
thank you, uh, thank you, President, and thank you, uh, Senator uh, Pocock, for his uh, first uh, supplementary uh, question. Uh, these are, of course, uh, issues that uh, the Finance uh, Minister, uh, of course, is particularly um, uh, concerned uh, uh, with, and uh, my um, understanding is that uh, she has uh, received some uh, some representations uh, in this uh, in this regard. Of course, that wouldn't be um, un, uh, unsurprising because um, in the lead up to the preparation for um, a budget, of course, uh, these will uh, all of these issues uh, <coughs> will uh, no doubt be uh, considered uh, by uh, by not only the finance minister but of course the uh, the treasurer in the preparation for the uh, uh, the budget that's coming up uh, in uh, in May. Thank you, ministers, Senator. Pocock, second supplement. Thank you, President. Thank, thank you, Minister. Uh, it's my understanding that ANO AO has completed just 16 out of 42 reports for this financial year. So that means there are 26 to be completed in the next three months. Uh, outside of the, the budget process, in principle, does the Labor government support full, fully funding the ANAO to ensure that it can undertake its vital task in our democracy? Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, um, Senator Pocock for his second, uh, second supplementary uh, uh, question. Uh, look, of, of, of course, um, we in opposition relied very heavily on the, uh, on the work that um, the ANOA uh, uh, did. Um, I know ANAO, yep, um, did in, uh, uh, in opposition. Um, of course, they did have the resources to do very thorough investigations, and of course, uh, we um, we we um, we uh, we saw the results of the uh, sports rorts uh, uh, investigations and the scandal that was associated uh, with that, which regrettably cost uh, Senator Mackenzie her uh, her ministry. Um, but look, we we um, we we um, we. Order. Me. Order. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Order across the chamber. Um, Senator Smith, I will just. I'm not sure the minister has concluded. I will check. Um, minister Farrell, have you concluded your answer? I think I have run out Time's of time. Up. Thank you, Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, President. My question is also to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. The February 2023 tax expenditures and insight statement reveals $67 billion of franking credits was distributed by Australian companies in 2019-2020. Can the minister tell the Senate how many billions of these funds from franking credits went to Australian charities and non-profits and how many charities were the beneficiaries of this important and necessary franking credit income? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator Smith, Smith for his, um, for his uh, question. Um, um, I personally don't have the breakdown of uh, uh, franking credits that uh, went to the organisations that uh, um, you, uh, you referred to. Um, but I am uh, happy to make some inquiries to see whether or not uh, that information uh, uh, can be broken down or um, uh, does exist in, uh, uh, in some, uh, some place um, so that I can uh, come back to you uh, with, uh, with a, uh, an appropriate answer to your, uh, to, to your question. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Um, Senator Smith, first supplementary. First supplementary, indeed. Can the minister explain to the Senate then how the government's changes to franking credits will apply to the income earning investment of charities? Uh, minister Farrell. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Smith for his, um, his first supplementary uh, question. Um, my um, understanding of uh, this issue is that there, there, there is, uh, is no change, um, but I uh, will um, follow that up with the, uh, uh, the finance uh, minister to confirm that that is uh, the case. I, 
I do say, I do say this that um, given that given that we given that we are fortunate in the Senate to actually have the fi finance minister uh, present, then um, of course these questions uh, might be might be better directed uh, towards the uh, the finance minister, and uh, that would uh, save. Uh, Save me having to come back uh, with answers uh, to you. But um, can I suggest that it might be more appropriate in the future that those sorts of questions be directed to the minister who uh, is thank responsible? Thank you, Minister. For the time for answering has expired. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Noting that Senator Farrell is the leader of the government in the Senate, and this is the government's policy. The national charity sector is fighting to meet unprecedented demand because of the Albanese government's mismanaged cost of living crisis. How much will your franking credit's broken promise cost Australian charities? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Smith for his uh, second supplementary uh, uh, question. <clears throat> um, I completely reject. I completely reject. Uh, the uh, the uh, accusation in your uh, question that um, the issues that uh, charities um, are dealing with um, at the moment have anything to do with the policies of the Labor government. It's this Labor government. It's this Labor government that's putting that downward pressure on the cost of living. How many times? How many times in the last week and a half? How many times in the last week Order. and a half? Order. Have I explained the downward pressure that we are putting on things like electricity price? How many? How many times? Uh, Minister how, Farrell, how many times? How many Minister times Farrell, have I talked? Please resume your seat. Order. Minister, please continue. Thank you. They don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to all of the things. They don't want to listen. They don't want to listen to the ways in which this government is putting downward pressure. And, Thank you, Minister. And that ought the to time be, for that answering to... has expired. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training. TAFE teachers in Tasmania are paid $60,000 a year at the moment, but the tradies who should be teaching these apprentices earn upwards of $100,000. Last week, when I asked about Tasmanian TAFEs using Cold War-era Soviet Union equipment to teach your electrician apprentices, the minister representing the Minister of Defence said, and I quote, we have revitalised the TAFE industry in this country, end quote. How does the government explain how a TAFE operating on coal bore equipment has been revitalised since you've been in government in nine months? Uh, minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Lambie. Uh, I can assure you, Senator Lambie, that in the Albanese government, you have a government that is an incredibly strong supporter of our TAFE system. Yeah. Uh, and that is a contrast to what we have seen over the last 10 years, where we saw uh, a government ideologically opposed to the public provision of vocational education and training. Uh, and if you needed any evidence of that, all you needed to do uh, was look at the, I think it was $4 billion that was ripped out of the TAFE system by the former government until just before the election they realised they had a political problem and started throwing a few extra dollars at it. So there is no, there is no doubt that in your home state of Tasmania, in my home state of Queensland and in every state and territory across the country, our TAFE system has paid the price for being starved of resources for nearly 10 years by a Liberal and National government that was ideologically opposed to it. Uh, and I take the interjection from I'm not quite, quite which saw government, uh, opposition senator trying to blame state governments. Well, you'd be talking about a Liberal state government in Tasmania, so I'm not quite sure how that helps your argument. Um, but, but, Senator Lambie, I agree with you that our TAFEs do Order need more investment. On my left. Uh, they do need more investment when it comes to capital equipment. They do need more investment when it comes to teachers' wages. They do need more investment when it comes to places uh, for TAFE. And that's exactly why the Albanese government 
went to the election with a commitment to do so, and we, I think it was out of the Jobs and Skills Summit, we committed to provide 180,000 new fee-free TAFE places uh, for in skills uh, that are in demand. I'm sure a considerable portion of them flow to your state of Tasmania, but this is an ongoing job. Uh, again, unfortunately, this is one of the various messes that we have inherited from the former government. It will take time to repair, uh, but at least we now have a government in Australia that is philosophically committed to our TAFE system and making it the centre of our vocational education, education and training system. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Don't worry, I'm coming for the Tasmanian State Government over this. Due to significant cuts by the previous government, Australia has lost the capacity to train apprentices. We all know that. Every year we have had fewer and fewer apprentices entering the workforce. Electrical apprentices in Tasmania are practising wiring equipment that isn't up to code. How does this government hope to achieve its housing policy and build much-needed homes in Tasmanians with so few apprentices in the construction industry? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Thanks, Senator Lambie. And again, Senator Lambie, I agree that our TAFE system has been starved of resources for far too long and that this is something that we do need the current federal government to be committed to, which is exactly what we are. I might say, Senator Lambie, I have a personal interest in this now, with having a year 11 son who's undertaking a school-based apprenticeship in the construction trade, and I want to make sure that he gets the same sort of opportunities that you're looking for kids in Tasmania to get as well when they're considering trade careers. Uh, as I mentioned, our government is investing significantly in the VET and TAFE system. In fact, we're investing $921.7 million over five years from 2022-23 to strengthen our VET system and address skill shortages. Uh, that includes $864.6 million over five years uh, to provide the fee-free TAFE places that I was talking about, as well as significant funding uh, in infrastructure and technology to support our TAFEs as well. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. I was just wondering if you could tell me how much money, if you have passed over any money to the state of Tasmania since you have been in, in government, how much has actually been allocated to our TAFE system for its revitalisation and how much money has actually been spent, if you know that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Um, thanks, Senator Lambie. I might need to come back to you with the precise figures, but what I do have to hand is uh, the funding that's provided, being provided to each state and territory under the new 12-month national skills agreement that we negotiated with the states and territories last year. The figures that I have here are that for that 12-month agreement, uh, the Commonwealth contribution to Tasmania is $13.5 million. The bulk of that uh, is in those fee-free TAFE places. Uh, I'm pretty sure, Senator Lambie, that this would be the new funding that's being provided in addition to whatever existing funding there was in place. Uh, but $13.5 million in total from the Commonwealth, of which $9.9 million is for fee-free TAFE places, uh, $0.5 million for student support, $0.6 million for data infrastructure, $2.5 million for the TAFE Tech Fund Tranche 1. Uh, and, and we would expect uh, that as time goes on, that additional funding will be increased because, as I've said, the Albanese government understands that the TAFE system is the centre of our training system. <laughs> Thank you, system. Minister. The time has expired. Senator Polly, first question. Uh, President, my question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. The 2023 Why Australia report launched today reinforces why there is no better place in the world to do business than in Australia. How does the Australian government plan to attract further international investment, and will this investment create more Australian jobs? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank um, <coughs> Senator Polly. This is uh, the second question from uh, <coughs> Tasmanian Senator today, and uh, I know you've got a great interest in this uh, area. The Albanese government has a simple message for international investors. We are open for business. Yeah. And today's release of the Why Australia report highlights this fact. Our strong economy, talented workforce, renewable energy resources and open trade and investment policies make Australia one of the best places to do business in the world. Australia's reputation as an open, stable and globally connected economy makes us a leading destination for innovative start-ups, uh, research organisations and global investors. 
Investors are fueling our growing technology sector, which is valued at over $167 billion and the third largest contributing sector to our GDP. Our supportive innovation ecosystems help spawn incredible innovations like Google Maps, Wi-Fi, the black box flight recorder and, of course, uh, the uh, terrific uh, cochlear implant. And our growing skilled work workforce means Australia is in an ideal place for international companies to expand their operations. But our government wants to go even further. We have an ambitious plan to become a renewable energy superpower and a nation that makes things again. These plans will help attract even more international investment here to Australia. More high quality international investments mean more and higher paying jobs here in Australia. More jobs in the industries of the future and in regional uh, Australia. Unlike the previous government, Australian jobs are a top priority for the Albanese Labor government. And I call on all of those opposite to support our legislation Thank you, to the strengthen the safeguards mechanism. Senator Polly, first supplementary. Yes, President. Uh, Minister, how has the last decade of policy uncertainty and inaction under the former Liberal National Government impacted international business investment in Australia? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Polly for her uh, first uh, question. The Albanese <coughs> Labor government uh, knows that the international investors crave certainty. But unfortunately, unfortunately, after a decade of Liberal national government, that's the last thing international investors got. Instead of a government that they could trust, they got a decade of infighting and political divisions which prevented any meaningful action on important matters impacting investment, like a plan to tackle climate change. Thankfully, our government is taking a responsible approach to policy that delivers what investors need most – certainty and stability. We have ended the climate wars by charting a sensible path to net zero through our safeguards legislation. This gives international businesses a clear and predictable framework to invest in the renewable industries Thank of the you, future. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, how would cross-party support for the safeguards mechanism and the National Reconstruction Fund give business certainty to help attract game-changing investment in Australia's domestic industries? Minister Farrell. Thank you, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Polly for her second uh, supplementary question. Uh, <clears throat> we're providing Australian industry and the economy with a stable, ambitious policy uh, environment for investment in decarbonisation of our domestic industries. Yesterday's announcement by the Prime Minister and the Energy Minister uh, was welcomed by the business, business Council of Australia and the Australian Industry Group, because they know our safeguards mechanism policy will help us attract game-changing investment into the future. Beyond providing certainty on, uh, on emissions, uh, we are providing certainty on government investment in the industries of the future through the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund. If senators in this place are serious about attracting international investment in the industries of the future, I encourage them to support our legislation for a stronger safeguards mechanism and the National Reconstruction Fund. Thank you, Minister. Senator Van. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, have all of the 90 Bushmasters promised by Australia to Ukraine on the 8th of April and 27th October 22 been delivered? Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Farrell. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Van, for, uh, for that question. Um, off the top of my head, I uh, don't know the answer to that question, but I will uh, make some inquiries after question time uh, with the, uh, <coughs> the uh, Defence Minister to get uh, a confirmation uh, of where we are um, <coughs> on, that, uh, on that issue. Um, Australia, of course, has been very supportive of the, uh, <coughs> not only the people of Ukraine, uh, but the government uh, 
of the of, of the Ukraine in this uh, terrible fight uh, that they now have uh, with the uh, the the, uh, the Russians. Um, I don't think, <coughs> outside of the uh, NATO uh, um, members, there's been a stronger supporter of the people of uh, Ukraine. Oh, uh, Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, Senator Vane. Um, Minister, you know that's not true. Senator Vane, don't you? what is why point are you of on order your feet? is misleading the Senate. That's not a point of order, Senator Van. Um, please resume your seat, Minister. Did you wish to continue? Yes, thank you, um, um, uh, uh, President. Um, um, yeah, apparently yeah. you can't pull people by. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, significant scale of Australian military assistance means that uh, we are still delivering items and will continue to do so over the uh, coming uh, months. Uh, for context, uh, the uh, scale of our support includes over 100 vehicles and uh, heavy artillery. We have uh, already flown more than 30 uh, C-17s and uh, Ukrainian uh, Anton Antonov's uh, flights with assistance uh, from Australia. Uh, delivering uh, items from uh, the other side of the world, uh, of course, uh, as you might uh, appreciate, is uh, an immense uh, logistical effort. Uh, but this government is prepared um, to continue to do that. Uh, of course, uh, one of the first things that uh, our Prime Minister did on um, becoming Prime Minister uh, was visit, uh, visit Kiev and uh, visit uh, the, uh, the, the, the President uh, of Ukraine. Thank you, Minister. Rest the time for answering has expired. Senator Van, first supplementary. Minister, what promised Australian assistance, military assistance, for Ukraine remains outstanding. Thank you, Senator Van. Minister Farrell. Um, well, uh, again, uh, Senator Van, I'm uh, very happy to uh, uh, <coughs> very happy to uh, consult with the uh, uh, <coughs> the Defence uh, Minister um, after uh, question time and uh, get uh, an answer uh, for you on that uh, on that question, but. Can I, can I say this, um, as I started to say before, uh, the people of uh, Ukraine, the government of the Ukraine, uh, have no uh, greater supporters than the Australian, uh, the Australian government and the Australian people. Um, we have uh, demonstrated, both through the visits that uh, our uh, Prime Minister has made to Ukraine and uh, by the ongoing military and uh, other forms of support. Uh, that uh, we continue to deplore the actions of uh, the, Soviet, the, uh, the Russian uh, government uh, under uh, uh, Putin, uh, and, uh, and we continue to ensure that we Thank support you, the people the of Ukraine. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Van, second supplementary. Minister, given Australia's proven ability to previously manage diplomatic representation in difficult environments like Kabul and Baghdad, Will the government reopen our embassy in Kiev? Thank you, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, you uh, um, uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Van. Um, the situation in Ukraine remains extremely uh, complex and challenging. Uh, in light of uh, rigorous safety and security assessments, the embassy continues to operate remotely from uh, Warsaw. DFAT is keeping this decision under review. The Embassy is managing Australia's interests effectively in Warsaw, including the, uh, the provision of consular services. Um, and uh, there's nothing that we will do that uh, seeks to uh, politically uh, influence uh, this, uh, this decision. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries, Senator Watt. Minister, we know that low wages was a, de a deliberate design feature of the previous Liberal government economic architecture. But it also turns out that funding cliffs was also a design feature of the previous government. Order. Minister, could you Order. please explain to the Senate why it is also important to provide long-term funding certainty for essential biosecurity services and how this protects our $76 billion agricultural export trade? Minister Watt. 
Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank you very much, Senator Giacconi. Well, you would think that it goes without saying that providing funding certainty for essential government functions like biosecurity is a core government responsibility. And you would think that, and certainly the Albanese government gets that. We understand that you need to protect the Australian agriculture industry from biosecurity threats that could wipe out our production and exports and drive up grocery costs for Australians. And that's because we are a responsible government. Biosecurity is critical for the future of the regions and our $76 billion agricultural export trade. Strong biosecurity means our farmers can get their produce, produce into overseas markets, building economic resilience and creating tens of thousands of jobs in our regions. In our first budget, the Albanese government invested $134 million in new biosecurity measures like extra frontline staff, 20 new detector dogs and, and stronger defences against foot and mouth disease and other emerging threats. Unfortunately, though, as we keep hearing, the Albanese government also inherited a series of budget booby traps left by a government that was all announcement and no delivery. Short-term funding in emergency management, in health, the arts, communications, national security and now biosecurity as well. The Liberals and Nationals were addicted to announcing programs that they didn't get around to funding. As we keep hearing, their record of providing short-term funding for essential services like biosecurity was appalling. Because of the member for Maranoa's incompetence and Senator McKenzie before him, biosecurity funding falls off a cliff over the next two years. In fact, it falls by 20 per cent on 30 June this year and another 25 per cent on 30 June next year. That's right, the funding engineered by Senator McKenzie and, and Mr Littleproud falls off a cliff by more than 40 per cent in two years. We are cleaning up the mess by the Liberals and Nationals in biosecurity you, because that's what good governments do. Has expired. Coney, first Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister, for that answer. It's quite uh, shocking to learn about that development. We know that strong biosecurity is good for Aussie farmers, important for food security Order. and essential for trade. Minister, could you please outline to the Senate the risks to regional Australia of making short-term funding decisions for essential biosecurity services? Minister Watt. I'd be delighted to. And there are risks. There are severe risks to our biosecurity, our agricultural industry and grocery prices as a result of these short-term funding decisions that were made for biosecurity uh, as there were in so many other areas. It's no wonder, with the former government's record around short-term terminating measures for budget of biosecurity, that the National Farmers Federation consistently called out the coalition for their failure to deliver sustainable biosecurity funding. But of course, rather than listen to our peak farming organisation and actually deliver, the Nationals' leader, David Littleproud, resorted to name-calling, labelling the NFF ignorant and sideline critics. Fortunately, in the Albanese government, the adults are in charge. We are working oh, with yeah. our farmers and we are working with our agriculture sector to fix our biosecurity system once and for all. In addition to the investments we made in our first budget, we're laying the foundations on traceability, something that was too hard for the National Party to deliver a fit-for-purpose modern system Thank to protect you, our what livestock industry. Thank you, Senator. The time industries. for answering has expired. Senator Ciccone, second supplementary. Thank you again and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Um, funding for biosecurity, it's fair to say, was left in a complete mess by the former Liberal National Government. Complete mess. What happens when governments don't plan for the future by making long-term investments in essential biosecurity? I'd appreciate your thoughts on that, Minister. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Giacconi. And of course, we did begin the job of fixing up this mess in our October budget, but of course, it is so big, it is so big that it's going to take even longer. Because we know that the Liberals and Nationals Order. announced programs but didn't Order. even fund them, even on issues important Minister to their own Watt. constituencies. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Minister Watt, please continue. President, the Liberals and Nationals announced programs but didn't even fund them, even on issues important to their own constituencies like biosecurity. And when you don't make long-term biosecurity investments, you leave Australia's farmers and our agriculture industry at risk. Senator McGrath. Now, I was very noticed uh, and I was very concerned to read an article just this week or in the last few days from ABC reporter Kath Sullivan, which reported that Australia's sniffer dogs haven't been sniffing for queen bees and were not on the beat when the deadly varroa mite arrived last 
last year. Now, why would that be? Well, if you go on to read in the Tony. article for several years, the then government had stopped training sniffer dogs to detect queen bees that might carry the varroa mite. That is the legacy of the coalition government. That is the risk that they were prepared to put biosecurity to because of this terminating measures Thank that we you, are having Minister, to fix up. Your time has expired. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I regrettably ask that uh, further questions uh, be placed on the notice paper. Uh, and I also uh, seek uh, leave to move a motion uh, relating to the hours of meeting and routine uh, of business uh, this week. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted, Senator Farrell. Uh, then, uh, pursuant to uh, con contingent notice standing in the name, of the Leader of the Government of the Senate, Senator Wong, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter, namely a motion to provide that a motion relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business this week may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate, and I move that the question uh, be now put. Oh, uh, Senator Birmingham. Well, President, President, what we have here is an attempt from the government um, to guillotine. It's guillotine, Birmingham. President. Senator the government Birmingham. is seeking to guillotine Senator its Birmingham. own guillotine because they Senator don't want to have debate. I'm calling you to order. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Birmingham, I. Senator McGrath and Senator Gallagher. Order on both sides of the chamber. Senator Birmingham, I, you stood, I gave you the call, and then I, you didn't call a point of order. I asked you to sit, and I, and I would ask in future when I ask you to sit that I should not have to ask a leader of a political party to sit three or four times. So the question is, so the question is that the motion as moved by Senator, that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the question be put. The ayes shall move for the right of the chairs, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart to tell her for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There have been 33 ayes and 27 noes. The matter is res resolved in the affirmative. So I'm now going to move the um, motion to suspend standing orders as moved by Senator Farrell. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I uh, believe the ayes have it. No, uh, ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Farrell to suspend standing orders be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urk as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes.
order, there being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, I move that a motion relating to hours of meeting and routine of business uh, this week uh, may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question uh, now be put. So the question is, uh, so the question is. Uh, Senator Farrell, uh, Senator Birmingham, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Well, Pre President, can I seek clarification here? Is the uh, outcome of the government's motion that the opposition is denied any right to speak at all to its substantial variation of hours for the rest uh, of the week? Senator, is that, uh, is that Senator what the government Birmingham, is seeking to do, Senator to deny Birmingham, any dissent or disagreement? Order. 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 Order on my left and right. Order across the chamber. The motion is moved by the minister is that the question be now put, and that's what I intend to do. So the question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question, as moved by Senator Farrell, that the question now be put be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister Farrell. Uh, um, President. Pardon, Minister, I now put the question. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Farrell um, be agreed to. That's the motion he read out prior to the question being put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division aye. required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Minister. Um, thank you, President. Uh, I move the motion as circulated. So the question is that the motion as moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I believe we're now going to taking note for a few short minutes. <laughs> Senator uh, Smith, I'll just wait for the deputy. Senator Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of all questions. Given to, so all answers given to all questions asked by coalition senators. 
Just a few months ago, uh, we heard how Labor was dragging its feet when it came to delivering on some fundamental election commitments when it came to the charities and not-for-profit sector. Dragging its feet on the Productivity Commission inquiry that was aimed at, giving, uh, aimed at doubling uh, giving by 2030. Dragging its feet on its building capacity, building community uh, policy. I'm pleased to say, uh, under a little bit of pressure from this chamber, we've now both seen the announcement of the Productivity Commission inquiry and we've seen some further detail in regards to the building capacity, building community initiatives. So why is it that having dragged its feet on providing some certainty about what the future for the charities and not-for-profit sector might look like under this government, is it now seeking to pull the rug from underneath those charities that earn an income through franked dividends? Very, very important question. And it's not a suggestion, it's not a guess on my part or on the coalition senator's part in terms of what is happening here. Labor is either consciously trying to rip money from the charities sector through its franking credit, credits plan, or it's designed a policy which will inadvertently hurt charities and rip not just a billion, but possibly two billion dollars worth of franking credit revenue from charities in Australia. Is it a conscious decision or is it the consequence of poor policy design? Now, Senator Polly, I can see you here looking uh, enthusiastic at my con contribution. I only have to direct you to page 52, to page 52 of the Tax Expenditures and Insights Statement document. It says at page 52, in 2019-20, Around $67 billion of franking credits uh, were Senator distributed Polly? by Australian uh, companies. Senator Smith is a point of order. Oh. Senator Polly. I ask that uh, the senator be required to withdraw his uh, assertions that I was enthusiastic about his contribution, knowing the history of his government. It's, uh, I'm not sure he needs to, to withdraw, but, put your, but I would ask that you direct your, um, your comments to the House through me. President. Senator Polly may not have been enthusiastic, but she was paying attention, and I thank her very much for that. So, paragraph three at page 52. You might like to grab it up on your iPhone, Senator Polly, before you make a contribution this afternoon. It says, in 2019-20, around $67 billion of franking credits were distributed by Australian companies. Around $17.2 billion of these were uh, claimed by 3.1 million residents on their individual tax returns that year. With the remainder, think about that, with the remainder, $50 billion, with the remainder flowing to other local entities, including companies, superannuation funds, and C-H-A-R-I-T-E-S, charities. The government's own document, released as part of the budget honesty process. So why is it then, why is it that this government feels that it needs to pick on charities? Slow to deliver their election commitments, slow to deliver the Productivity Commission in inquiry into doubling giving by, giving by 2030, and now hidden at page 52 of the tax expenditures statement, Labor's plan to make it harder again for charities. But just think about this for a moment. A little while ago, they announced a Productivity Commission inquiry to double giving by 2030. And here at page 52 is a plan that will make it harder for charities to earn income. Peter robbing to pay Paul. This is crazy. This is inconsistent. At a time, and this is the most serious point, at a time when Australian charities and the not-for-profit sector needs to be supported in our community more than at any other time in recent history. Uh, Senator Polly, that concludes uh, take note because we have, to, we have a hard marker with a motion previously moved in the Senate. So I'll put the question. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Pursuant to order, I call.